Um, it's the second Sunday on the row. God changed my message based upon something that somebody said. God using that to work in me and deal with me a little bit. The Bible says of shepherds that it behooves them to know the state of their flocks, the condition of their people. And um, things I've taught many years ago in the past, to me it seems like I just taught them a couple months ago. When I go back and look at my notes, they're all, I'll turn the microphone on when I'm good and ready. I'm good and ready. Um, what was I saying? Anyway, God changed my message this morning. And based upon something that somebody asked me about, I, uh, I know that I've taught some of these things before, uh, but I'm like Peter. Every now and then, I mean to stir them up in your remembrance. Uh, the devil will often try to get us to forget God's Word. If he can get us to forget and neglect the reading of God's Word, the thinking on God's Word, the meditating on God's Word, if he can get us to do that, then, uh, then he can move in with his lies and shroud over the Word of God, choke out the Word of God with his lies. There upon the screen, uh, just a sample of the many people that we were able to be a blessing to this weekend and again for us here at Bethel these black lives matter uh, it looks to me like this lady here might be pregnant um, Michael how is the woman that had the baby that she hadn't eaten in several days and doing pretty good that's what I like to hear. Amen. Give the Lord a hand for that. <laughs> Clap your hands, all you people. Shout into God with a voice of triumph. Uh, in some of these cases, the, the place that you see the people sitting is in some cases the place where they live. And um, I would... I know... I know that there is a certain amount of racism that does go on in this country on both sides. Uh, but I just would encourage anybody who thinks they have it bad in this country to go here. And live with these people, live among them, so you understand there's a difference. This young lady here seems to be, let me get her back here, uh, that she is nursing a young baby. That is the place where she lives. That's it. No roof, nothing. The straw that she lays on is her bed. And these people are very precious. This man, I think he's asleep. I looked at the picture closely. His eyes are open. So I think they caught him asleep. So they just laid the food down next to him. He got a surprise when he woke up. He might have thought angels came by and blessed him. Amen. Beautiful young lady sitting there. Ephesians, I told you 2 Corinthians 11. Hang on to that place. Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, at the end of the service, remind me. Uh, there's someone here who wants us to follow the commandment given in the book of James. Is any among you sick? Uh, let them call for the elders. Let them anoint their head with oil and pray for their healing. And we're going to do that today at the end of today's service with someone. Someone who uh, had heard me say, he'd recommend a book that God used to really help me at a time when I needed help. I needed to know that God 
did hear my prayers. And I needed to learn the nature of God to know then how God would answer that prayer. And that God wasn't depending on me to be the superman that was going to bring deliverance in somebody's life. He does that. And instead of God having a lot of confidence in me, I'm the one that has to have a lot of confidence in God. Amen? God had to teach me that. But it was a book written by John R. Rice. Rose, actually, she had a uh, family member died. They gave Rose all of her religious books, and she laid a bunch of them on my desk. Bad thing to do, because they just sit there for months. And uh, finally, one day, I was in a very sour mood, and I was a little bit angry with God. And I thought, I need to get my mind off this, so I reached over that stack of books. The first one on the top was a book written by John R. Rice called Prayer, Asking and Receiving. And by that time, God had already worked in me that when I have a book like that, a religious book, I don't necessarily really read much of what the author said. Show me the scriptures. And that's what I went to. I was looking at this, and he gave a lot of scriptures as to why he believed, what he believed, why he was teaching what he was teaching. And it really helped me. I mean, it really helped me. So today's message, uh, I'll, Lindsay, write this down somewhere, how thorns work in grace. How thorns of the flesh work in grace. Ask yourself, what is grace? Does grace only apply to the salvation of our souls? No. Grace is is everything that God does in you that you never had deserved to begin with. It is undeserved, unmerited working and sustaining of God in you to provide for you what you are totally incapable of providing for yourself. If God thought that you could do this for yourself, he would merely stand back in heaven with his arms crossed saying, go ahead and do it. I'm sure a lot of us have maybe said to God or to ourselves, I can do this on my own. I don't need help with God. And God, like any good parent, laughs his head off and he says, go ahead and do it. Like telling one of your two-year-olds, let, let mommy help you put your clothes on. No, I can do it. And then it's funny because you go in there and you see that their arm is through the head hole like this. And you've got to unwind it. Matthew, when he was a little, decided he was going to put his own seatbelt on. And to this day, I have no idea what he did. But we stopped at a lady's house. We was going to go and talk to her for a little bit. And Matthew is in the back seat of the van, his arms and legs up, up over his head, and, his, and the seat belt was intertwined in and around his limbs in such a way as I'm going, how did you even do this? This defies, this defies the laws of physics. Did you run the seat belt through your body? And it took me 30 minutes to get him out of the back of that car. Couldn't do it by himself. Ephesians 2 8 says, For by grace, in fact, read this out loud with me. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Which God hath ordained before, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. So I'm going to ask you the question. Where does grace come from? God. Does it come from us? No. It comes from God. Who saves us? Do we save ourselves? No. I'll ask you this. Where does faith come from? God. 
Does faith stem out of ourselves? No. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. God's still the source of the faith that saves us. If there is something done in our lives, who did it? God and God alone did it. In eternity, we're going to be rejoicing around the throne of God for eternity and not giving glory to any one of us. It is nothing but by the grace of God. Now here's what happens. Turn to 2 Corinthians 12. All of us. All of us. Have a past. All of us have a pretty rotten one. Pretty bad one. Done things shouldn't have done. Done things that we were warned not to do, but we did them anyway. Found out the results of doing those things was more than what we could handle. And we asked God to step in and intervene and save us because we could not save ourselves. All of us have things about ourselves that we don't like. Things about our nature that we do that we don't like doing. And we don't want to do them anymore. And we ask God, God, will you take this away from me? Now you've got some preachers who will tell you, well... If God didn't do it, obviously you're not asking in the right way. Or obviously you don't really want it. Or obviously you're not using the right words. Or you don't have enough faith. Or it's always something on you is why God didn't do just exactly what you commanded him to do. It's always something. It's always your fault. Because if you just believe God, well, God will do, will do everything for you. Which is not true. It's not true. Consider healing. Does God heal everybody that is sick? Eventually. In death. God has healed people's livers, backs, eyes, brains, lungs. God has healed people only to have them die anyway. But death to a saint is the ultimate healing, is it not? So why are we so adamantly against that? Why is it that some people think that death is the victory of Satan and we could have stopped it, we just didn't have enough faith? But excuse me, everybody dies. You know why everybody dies? Everybody's a sinner. And it is appointed unto man once to die. And after this is the judgment. Why? Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, does God always heal just because somebody asks God to heal them? No. Does God always heal just because they came to the elders, we anointed their head with oil, prayed for their healing? Does God always heal just because we did this? No. No. Let me ask you this question. Is God smarter than you? Does God know more than you do? Does God know more about you than you know about yourself? Does God know more about you than you want God to know about you? Of course He does. And does, does God know that there are better things for you than what you ask for in prayer? Yes, he does. This is one of those examples. 
2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is how thorns work in grace. Paul said, of such a one will I glory. Yet of myself, I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. Underline that word, infirmities. And when you get home today, you get somewhere where you can research words in the Bible. You can download the software that we have, Pure Bible Search software. Free download. We don't charge for it. It's written free. It was given to us free. We are distributing it out free. Wouldn't, think, wouldn't for a moment think of charging for God's word. And then you look up the word infirmity or infirmities. You'll see that they're applied, it's applied to a lot of different things in the Bible. In some cases, it's physical illnesses. And in other cases, it is sins. Did you know that all the priests, the Levite priests in Israel had infirmities of the flesh? They were all sinners. And that before they could offer an atonement for a family that brought their county fair lamb or their best... Uh, Offering before God that before they could offer their sacrifice for their sins, they had to offer an atonement for themselves. Because they were sinners. They had infirmities. God used men who had infirmities to do His will, to serve in His, His holy house. God used those men. And God uses them even today. There are various, as I said, there are various types of infirmities. There are sicknesses, diseases. Some of them afflict the body, some of them afflict the mind. And then there is the, infir the infirmity of sin. Sin is an infirmity. It is something that creeps up in your life. It is something that's there when you were born. You were born a sinner, you will die a sinner, and there's no way out of it. And yet, look at what Paul said. Of myself, I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. Now you've got one crowd in this world telling you that God only blesses and honors those who live in perfect health. That's a lie. I don't know anybody like that. All I know is a bunch of people who have various illnesses, various diseases, and various sins. So Paul said, verse 6, For though I would desire the glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. What a way to present yourself to the world. I don't want you thinking that I'm somebody you're not. In my life, I've idolized men, especially men in the ministry. Only to have those men offend me in some way. Or to find out some things that those men believed that I knew was absolutely wrong. One man that I greatly admired in the ministry saw it in me. And he came to me and he said, Mike, I am not who you think I am. He read right through me. He saw, he saw me, knew what I was doing. I don't want anybody to think of me above anything that I am. I'm not much. Verse 7, Paul said, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Who gave it to him? God. Notice what his thorn was. A messenger of Satan... To buffet me. Paul had, when he was saved, and he went to Damascus, he was baptized, healed of his eyes, the scales fell off his eyes, now he can see. And Paul tells us that instead of conferring with flesh and blood about the doctrines that he should believe, he got alone and he met with Jesus himself. Now, I don't know of too many people that can boast of that. That they learned it from Jesus himself. But Paul did. And the old nature of Paul was, he gloated. 
He was arrogant and very prideful of his religious standing. And that was his nature. Now he's got to learn a different way. That now he's been given revelations about the mysteries of God by Jesus Christ himself. And his nature is to use that against everybody and say, Shut up and listen to me. I know best for you. That's his nature. But he knows that's not, that's not good. So he said, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this saying I besought the Lord thrice. Now underline that word, thrice. Why do we care how many times Paul prayed about that? Why do we care? Because if you were to ask me how many times I've prayed for certain things, I'd say, I don't know. Several, several times. Multiple times. Or I, I prayed about it once. But I could not sit here and tell you things that I've prayed for in my life that I've asked God a specific number of times. But Paul specifically said three times. Why did he do that? He's given us a clue here. And if you read this passage and read the rest of everything that Paul said in the Bible, tell me what that thorn was. We have theories. But he doesn't actually identify the specific thorn that's in him. There's a reason for that. He, because he knows that you, as a believer like he is, will be able to identify with him. Unless, of course, you had something different than what Paul said he had. And then you would say, well, maybe that doesn't apply to me because I'm not like Paul. I didn't have his specific thorn. So maybe this doesn't apply to me. I guarantee you the Holy Ghost knew to leave it wide open for you so that everybody could draw an application from this. I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. Now, here's, here's one of those places where we use words the wrong way. Did you get enough ketchup on your hamburger? Well, it was sufficient. What does that mean? They could have put more on it. Right? Did you get enough eggs for breakfast? Well... I guess they'll tide me over. I guess they are sufficient. But we use that in a wrong way. Sufficient means it does exactly what it's supposed to do. It's enough. It'll do the trick. How many sticks of dynamite do you need to blow up somebody's car? I think just one will do it. I think just one will do it. One is sufficient. If you put 30 of them in there, that's just overkill. So you see what I'm getting at? When, Paul's, when the Lord told Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee, he's not telling him, Paul, it's just barely enough for you to get by. God is telling Paul, Paul, it is everything that you need to get by. And there will be nothing else that you will need to get through this life. Nothing. That's what sufficient really means. Is God the kind of God who gives us barely enough? Not when he told David, my cup runneth over. My grace is sufficient thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, will, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Look at the change now in his life, where he was praying for God multiple times to remove this thorn from him. Once God says to him, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul says, fine, I'll keep the infirmities. I'll glory in them. God, I'll never, God, I promise you, I will never ask you to take this away from me ever again. Because what God gave Paul 
was better than what he asked for. Paul may not have seen it at that time. He didn't see it the first time he asked. He didn't see it the second time he asked. Didn't see it the third time he asked. But finally God said, Paul, I'll give you grace. That's better than me taking your thorn away. I'm going to leave the thorn there. But I'm going to give you grace to endure it. So, again, I go back to this statement. When you pray to God, God will either A, give you exactly what you asked for, or He will give you better than what you asked for. And when, you, when He does that, you'll go, Wow, that was better than what I asked for. But it wasn't what I asked for. And that means God is smarter than you are. Amen? I glad the rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. Look at these. Infirmities. Reproaches. Necessities. Persecutions. Distresses. Five is the number for grace. Fifth time Noah's name is mentioned. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. I should have asked you today, how many of you want to be strong in the Lord? You'd say, Amen. Good. Starts by being weak. Now let's pray and let's understand how thorns work in grace. Father in heaven, we come before you today. And Father, I believe that this was the message you wanted me to preach today. If I'm wrong, Lord, I apologize. But I know there's a need. I know there's a need in this room today. And Father, I'm aware that there may be needs that I'm not aware of in this room today. Father, these are things that I didn't learn in a book. I didn't study them in a class in Bible college. I didn't steal it, download it off the internet. This is something that I myself struggled with greatly. Wasn't sure if I was going to make it. When you stepped in and led me to study this. And in studying it, Father, I became fam a little bit more familiar with your nature. Your character. How you work. What you will do. What you won't do. And Father, it surprised me. Because I thought... That my life, living for you, was supposed to be perfect, sin-free, never a problem, never anything going wrong, never an infirmity, living the dream. I thought that's how it was supposed to be, and I thought I was had it all wrong and wasn't going to make it. And God, you stepped in at the right time. Now, Father, uh, this preacher has thorns. And these people sitting here today have them. I've had many of them in my life. Some you have taken away. Of that, there's no doubt. But even, Lord, in the ones you've taken away, you put others in their place. I am not thorn free but I know what they're there for and I know what my responsibility is and all I ask God is for you to give me the grace to do what you called me to do let this be a blessing to somebody the world has got all kinds of false teachings about sin about healing People being told that 
if they didn't get healed, it's because they did something wrong. They didn't ask God right. They didn't ask God enough or they didn't really mean it or God's waiting for them to make the first move or all this other nonsense that people give. And it's a lie because they don't know you. They don't know your word. They don't know you. So Father, show us your grace in the presence of the thorns that you give us. Give us great wisdom today and let, let this help somebody. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. Now, without telling on yourself, although you can if you want, tell me from your experience in God's Word, your experience in Christian life, what thorns Represent What are they? What could they be in a person's life? Sin. Sin. Alcohol, drugs. Thoughts. Thoughts. Huh? Weaknesses. Weaknesses. People. People. Huh? Pride. Pride's a big one. See, pride was the one that Paul had that God gave him the thorn so he wouldn't have the pride anymore. He reduced Paul down to nothing so that you can't rejoice over nothing. You can't be boastful over nothing. He reduced Paul down to a state. Let that devil beat on him. Bring him to a state to where Paul can't take credit for the revelations that he has. Because he would have. The old Saul would have in a heartbeat. The new Paul won't do it. Okay? Somebody else. Possessions. Boy, you guys are reading your Bible. You know these things. Yes, Rose. Prejudices. Thorns in the flesh. Sister Pam. Desires. Yep. Yes, Dave. Huh? Idols. Idols, which is covetousness. Okay? Lack of... Go ahead. Freedom? You know what? In a way, that's pretty true. Because some people use freedom as a means to do whatever they want to do. Okay? So I get that. Treasures of this earth, contentions, um, the 18 works of the flesh that Paul mentioned in Galatians, in Galatians chapter 5, would fit into this category. All sin fits into this category. Now, this is what throws people. Pastor, you tell me that God wants me to sin, so no. I'm telling you that you already were. And what did God give you for that sin? Grace. For we for by grace are we saved. Turn to Genesis three. Genesis chapter three. This, God shows us this now, the result of sin. That and the connection to why Paul asked for it to be gone three times. You'll see it. Galatians chapter 3, verse 17. Unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Adam lived in a paradise. He had everything freely given to him. All the fruit of the trees. Everything. He had everything freely given to him. We live in a world now where people are so impoverished because of sin that they're starving to death. 
which is why we never run out of, we're never going to run out of people to feed in Kenya. There's never going to come a day when we've given out so much food that they're going to say, man, that's going to tie us up for the rest of eternity. We'll never, need, we'll never starve again. That's never going to happen. So he said, Curse is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. How many has ever had problems with their job? Things working against you while you're trying to work a job. You ever had that happen? It happens to everybody. Why? God cursed it. God required it at our hands because of sin. And then he said, I'll curse that labor. You're going to sow seed and it's going to do nothing but bring up thorns and thistles to you. How many of you ever tried to eat thistles for breakfast? It's like spitting shot out of a squirrel. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So number one, you said, Dave, sin. That's dead on. The result, that got the curse that God placed upon Adam, the man, who knew better was that he would sow his seed in his labor to put bread on his table, but what would be drawn up out of the ground were thorns and thistles. And you don't eat thistles. You're going to have to deal with the thorns in this life. It doesn't matter. How long you've been a Christian. How high you are with God. How much of the Bible you read. How much money you tithe. How long you've been a faithful member. It doesn't matter. Everybody has got one or two or three. Curse of sin. The result of sin. Now turn to Numbers 33. God is a God of order. He's God of patterns. Once you understand these patterns by reading the Bible, you become familiar with the nature of God, the character of God. The Bible says that we have the mind of God through Christ. We have the mind of Christ. We understand how God does work. We understand how God does answer our prayers. We understand that though we prayed for one thing, and yet we didn't get that thing, and all of a sudden now we've got something else, then once you know God and His nature, then you understand that God gave you that as a replacement for what you prayed for. And it wasn't God being mean and cruel to you and hating your guts and saying you didn't say the right words, you weren't facing east when you said it, you weren't standing at the little spot there in the Catholic Church where you got to stand to do everything. You didn't do what I told you to do, so therefore I'm not giving you what you asked for. I'm going to be mean to you. In fact, here's what Jesus told us. He said, how many of you fathers, having children, if your children ask you for bread, would you give them thorns? None of us. My children ask me for things, I give it to them. Most of them are grown. They're still asking for things. I give it to them. I love them. And I'm an evil father. God is not. So what God gave you, it would defy His nature if He gave you worse than what you asked for. It would fulfill His nature if He gave you better than what you asked for. Keep the thorn. I'll give you grace. Thorns are always temporary. Grace is everlasting. Which would you take? The inheritance or a bowl of lentils? <laughs> <laughs> 
like Esau asked for, a bowl of pottage, which would you rather have? Okay? Numbers chapter 33, verse 51. God says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you are passed over into Jordan, into the land of Canaan. So this is after you get saved. You're saved now. You've been brought out of bondage. You're saved. Then he said, Then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their pictures, destroy all their molten images, and quite pluck down their high places. Count, count the number of things he tells them to do here. How many? He says, drive out the inhabitants, destroy all their pictures, destroy all their molten images, quite pluck down all their high places. Four. It's always going to be related to the gospel. Spiritual things. And then he said in verse 53, And ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein. For I have given you the land to possess it. Ye shall divide the land by lot for an inheritance among your families. And to, the, and to the more ye shall give the more inheritance. And to the fewer ye shall give the less inheritance. Every man's inheritance shall be in the place where his lot falleth. According to the tribes of your fathers ye shall inherit. But if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which you let remain of you shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides and shall vex you. Who said people are a thorn? There you go. In the land wherein you dwell. Moreover, it shall come to pass that I shall do unto you as I thought to do unto them. Now notice what God is saying. God told, watch this now. Let's say that, let's say that John was a high rolling gambler before he got saved. A sleazy alcoholic. What in the bed that he turned down. Smoked dope. Did everything wrong. God saved him and said, Now John, get rid of all of those things. I'm here to tell you, John didn't have the ability to get rid of those things. Some of you come out of alcoholism and drugs. If God were to say to you, I want you to get rid of all your drugs, get rid of all your drug fam, uh, friends, and promise me that you'll never, ever, ever even want to do those things ever again, I'll give you eternal life. You couldn't do it. You're incapable of doing it. Sin is always going to be more powerful than your flesh's ability to stop sinning. Amen? And I'm going to prove that. So God tells them, get rid of all of those enemies. Because I drove them out. And if you go in there doing what they're doing, I'll drive you out. However, did Joshua obey God? No. Turn to Judges chapter 2. This is how thorns work in grace. Judges chapter 2 verse 1. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you into the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as what? Thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. So make a list of make a list of your sins in your mind. Put the top five sins of your life in a list. Now, are there more sins? Yeah. But 
for some reason, they just don't bother you. But if I were to have you write all these down, hand all your papers in, and I'm going to stand here and read your name and then read off what you got in your life, which you ought to be glad that I don't do that. You could pay me a little extra for not doing that. I'll do, I won't do it. But if I were to read everybody's list, I guarantee you, her list be different than her list. And his list be different from your list. Maybe some will be the same. But everybody's is different. That's why Paul didn't say, this is my thorn. This is the only thing that it is. And if you're not like this, then this doesn't apply to you. That's why he didn't. That's why I said it that way he did it. It's so that it could be applied to everybody. There were things in your life when you got saved that you couldn't remove. So God left some of them there. But why did he do that? Look at Exodus 20. In fact, turn to these two verses. I want you to underline these in your Bible. You're going to need these. This will give you help. This will give you understanding. There's a group, the, um, the Nazarene Church. Church of the Nazarene. They believe a doctrine called instant sanctification. That when you're born again... God instantaneously removes all sin out of your life so that you are not now a sinner and you never will be the rest of your life. They're lying. And I know they are. They're lying through their teeth. The Nazarene church has the same roots as the Methodist church and others, Wesleyan holiness. They were based upon the... A ministry of John and Charles Wesley, two great men in the kingdom of God, uh, but they were flawed. And I don't know exactly where the Nazarene church gets that. I don't know if they got it from the Wesleys or they just developed it on their own, but that's what they believe. And all that does is produce a church full of hypocrites. Standing there claiming that they don't have any sin. But they do. Bad. So it causes them all to be liars. Okay? Causes them all to be liars. I am instantly sanctified. I have no sin. And if that's what they testify in their church, they're lying through their teeth. Good grief, is it? I thought it was 1120. Man. Exodus 23, 30. By little and little I will drive them out from before thee until thou be increased and inherit the land. How did God say he was going to do it? By little and little. He didn't say, I'm going to get rid of them all in the same day. And then notice this, Deuteronomy 7.22. The Lord thy God will put out those nations from before thee, little by little, that thou mayest not consume them all at once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon thee. So God had a reason for it. I'm going to take them out little by little. Now, obviously, in everybody's life here who's saved, there are some things that you just don't deal with anymore in your life. They're gone. Amen? And aren't you glad? I'm not the man I want to be, but I'm not the man I used to be. Amen. So I have found God deals with me about something. I'm a man who's made a lot of mistakes. In the ministry, I've made a lot of mistakes. I'm human. Judgment errors, sin, doctrine wrong. I've made a lot of mistakes. I like to learn from those mistakes so that I don't do those anymore. But I have found that when I get to a point where I don't make these mistakes anymore, I'm now in a place where I'm making brand new ones. And I do. God has removed thorns out of my life 
only for me to realize that I have other ones there. I'm not free. 2 Samuel 23, 6, Sons of Belial shall be it, all of them as thorns thrust away because they cannot be taken with hands. You understand that, don't you? You find yourself walking through the woods, deer season, or squirrel hunting, and you walk into a thorn thicket, you cannot remove them with your hands, can you? You know what that means? You couldn't take them away if you wanted to. You have no ability to do that. Mark chapter 4, turn there. I, boy, I did. I did. I don't know why I thought it was... I thought I was an hour ahead on my sermon. I thought, man, I got plenty of time. Mark chapter 4, verse 18. He teaches us this in the parable of the seed and the sower. These are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word... And notice this, the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of the riches, and the loss of other things entering in, choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. What is the danger of these thorns if they are not taken care of in your life? They will choke the word of God out and you won't believe it anymore. Do you, has that happened? Has that happened to somebody you know? That sin crept back into their life choked out the Word of God. They either A, don't go to church anymore, or B, go to a church that lets them keep all their sins. Choke the Word out. Proverbs 15, 19, the way of the slothful man is as a hedge of thorns. Proverbs 22, 5, thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. Jeremiah 4, 3, thus said the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. So in these three verses, he tells us the way of a slothful man is as a hedge of thorns. The thorns are there. A slothful man, a lazy man, will allow them to grow so much that they choke out the Word of God in your life and you don't believe it anymore. So, yes, God is the one who removes them. But remember, He's going to use your hands to do it. Are you up for it? Say amen. Uh, Proverbs 24, verse 30. I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof. The stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well and I looked upon it and received instruction. Again, the field of the slothful the field is going to be overgrown with thorns. And if the thorns are not taken out by the grace of God, then you have but one thing coming to you. Turn to Hebrews chapter 6. Verse 4. This is a very debated, contested passage in the Scripture. It is misunderstood by many. Some say that Paul merely is giving here an impossible, hypothetical situation that will never happen. I say, it does happen. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified of themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open chain. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. That's the seed that was sown, which is the word of God. It's blessed by God and it produces fruit. But that which is that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be born burned. So you've got a choice in life. The thorns are there, and there's a lot more to this that I 
don't have time to present to you today. But the thorns are there. A slothful man will do nothing about it and they'll kill his relationship with God. God actually used the word disinherit. And he told Israel, as I thought to do to them, that's what I'm going to do to you. Or, you cannot be slothful, be a worker in God's vineyard and say, every time these things pop up, I'm going to dig them up and get rid of them. Because I don't want them there. Again, who can take them away? Turn to John 19, and I'm going to let you go, but we've got to lay hands on somebody first. John 19. What did they put on Jesus' head at Golgotha? The soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. They smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again, saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. The Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. Now, here's what I found. All of us, those thorns represent our enemies. The enemies that abide in our flesh. I've got them, you've got them. As God has taken away some from me, in some cases, He's replaced it with others. Now, I don't want the old ones back. But I can see clearly that He's let other thorns, other messengers of Satan to buffet me. I woke up this morning buffeted. Buffeted. I did not wake up well this morning. I woke up very buffeted, very down. And I've asked God, God remove that from me. And God says, I'll give you grace. And I realize what it's for. It's to cause me to rely upon God every day. Because it occurs often. Often. Now, as people get older, the thorns that they bear in their flesh, God does start removing some of them, or He gives them more grace. Until finally, there's one thorn left to deal with in a person's life. It's the very last enemy. Death. Death is a thorn. The sting of death is sin. Strength of sin is law. So you will find, if God allows you to grow to an old age, what you will find is, is that there becomes less and less desire in your life for pride or sin. But there still is one enemy to face. And that's death. But guess what? Christ bore that to the cross, nailing it to the cross, so that when this dies, the soul then becomes alive. You're going to win that one too. And it'll be done by what? Grace. Now, Sister Donna, come down here. Ken, give her a hand. Now I'm going to ask for the elder men to come down here. Those who are saved, believe the Bible. She contacted me and she confided some things in me. 
and I can, it, here's what it looks like to me, and this is what she seems to agree with. She had a thorn in her life. And she, she didn't like it. She hated it. God's taken that away, but He's given her this. Okay? Now, I'm not going to ask if you'd rather have the old one back. I didn't want the old one back. Okay? So she's come. She's reading that book that I told her to read about prayer, asking and receiving. And it's a pretty good book. Okay, might be some things I might not agree with in there, but all in all, it got a lot of scripture in it. But she's asked for us to lay hands upon her for her healing. Now, God's either going to heal her, or he's going to give her something better than healing her. But it won't be worse than healing her. Amen? Amen? Never is. You believe that? Amen. It's going to get messy. Men, come in. Father, we call upon you today. We ask you, dear God, we thank you for your word. We come before you in faith, trusting in your word and only your word. And Father, there are things we understand and things we don't. You don't penalize us, God, because of things we can't see. You just simply ask us to trust you and to wait upon you. So Father, Sister Donna and her husband Ken have come before us today in faith. We've anointed her head with oil. We've laid hands on her. We're asking you, God, to give her the desires of her heart and to heal her body. But Father, her soul is way more important. So Father, we pray to your God she would heal her soul. And Father, whether she rises up out of this wheelchair today, tomorrow, ten years from now, or she doesn't, you promised that you'd never give her anything worse. God, that you would grant her something far better. And when Paul realized this, God, he was happy that you had satisfied him with your strength in his weakness. So, Father, we lay hands on our dear sister. We thank you for her faith, her willingness, God, to come and appeal to you. We pray, dear God, that you would honor and bless that. Father, do this for your kingdom's sake, for your name's sake, for her sake, for her family's sake, for our church to be blessed by it. But, Father, do it for your sake. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and all of God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you, sister. Thank you. Amen.